Welcome everyone to another MLOps community coffee session. Today I'm joined by none other than Diego Oppenheimer and my man Vishnu. I want to start out the session by saying a big thank you to Diego and the Algorithmia crew for sponsoring this session. It is an absolute honor to have them A, in the community and B, throwing their weight behind the community and really supporting us in what we're doing and showing that they appreciate what is happening. Diego has been a huge supporter from the get-go. He sent me over one of these awesome bottles that I managed to break and then I got a new one. So big thanks to Diego and Algorithmia. Today, we're going to be talking a lot about security and governance and how that relates to MLOps. There's a blog post if you want to know more from Algorithmia, and we'll link to that in the description. So without further ado, let's get into it. Diego, it's been a while since we chatted. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me. Always super excited to uh, be chatting with the MLOps community. It's uh, definitely my favorite community that I've ever worked with. And so uh super relevant uh to the space and really exciting to see uh i mean the growth i think what like when first invited me dimitris was like what yeah. like 100 people yeah and like what are we at like 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. Yeah. i was looking at the numbers today i think when you were in when you joined the meetup last year it was like may or june 2020 i think it was at 300 500 people yeah. today it's at 5,287. Yeah. this space is exploding yeah, great work. Uh, super excited. I love the you know the, the fact that you know we're getting into that like level of maturity in machine learning where people are actually like kind of thinking about operating at scale and like how it's going to be applied and like so the the fact that there's that level of interest is uh, is I mean who could ask for anything better? Yeah, super exciting and it is very funny because we talked pretty much one year ago, almost to the day, and you gave an incredible explanation on the build versus buy paradigm, which I still refer back to many times when that comes up because it was so in depth and it was it just covered all of the bases on what you need to know, especially when you're looking at building versus buying when it comes to an MLOps tool or just your MLOps infrastructure. And so we will also actually link to that in the description below because I think that's a great one. Even though it is a year old, I don't think a lot has changed. The ba the greater ideas there haven't really changed much. So that is very cool. Now, today, though, we're going to talk a lot about security. And I love the way that you look at it in the community, in the community Slack, you're very active whenever security topics come up. And so that's why I wanted to talk about this with you because I think you're looking at it in a very unique way and you're also very, very focused on it. Maybe you can share with us why you're so focused on it. Is it just because you have all these enterprise customers that are asking for it? Or were you burned in the past? Do you have any war stories for us? What is it, your, your fascination or your uh, fixation on security? Yeah, so maybe I'll start from like, kind of like, you know, where, you know, uh, there's kind of a separation in, in like our head and how we think about things between like what I would consider like machine learning dev or development and trade, you know, people call it training, but just let's call it de ML dev, right? Cause there's, it's bigger than just training. It's like everything from data acquisition to building out and production operational systems. And they're obviously very, very tied together. You can't de-link them because of, you know, you have to retrain on new data and it has to be all automated. Everything that all the, all the goodies that we talk about from like end-to-end -end processes. But when you're really kind of focused, which is what Algorithmia does on the operational systems, there's a there's a key component in that, right? Which is okay. An operational system is one that is running all the time. It's built into the operations of an organization, and it has a level of um, scrutiny from a governance and security perspective that is way higher than any dev environment. And this is not like new to machine learning, right? Like if you think about a software development process, the level of scrutiny for apps and, pro and and development that you know that of, of the operational software is much higher you know what devops does for kind of like the things that run the business 
is much higher than you know you, you can you can allow for more stuff when you're doing on the development side. And so high level, you know, we as an organization and kind of what we do, we focus on the operational side of machine learning. And because the operational side of machine learning is so tied to the operations of an organization, right? You have to kind of live within the IT security governance standards of that organization. And this goes even particular, like higher, if you're talking about regulated industries, right? So things like financial services and life sciences and defense, you know, these are, you know, these operational systems just have a level of scrutiny uh, that are way beyond the, um, you know, kind of like what you see there generally in development. And so that's kind of why we, you know, that's just kind of like the world we live in. Um, and, you know, my general perception and, you know, you know, the way I look at it is, you know, five years from now, we won't be talking about machine learning anymore. We'll just be talking about software. It'll be implied that every single piece of software that we're writing will have some level of predictive analytics or machine learning embedded into it. And so what we're really talking about is operational system software here and what is going to be required for that to be able to happen and organizations to kind of bet the house on, on ML uh, in this, you know, for fraud detection, for sales, for acquisition, for kind of all these use cases that exist there. Okay. And when we kind of double click into that, now you start getting into like, you know, kind of what traditionally is IT governance with the flavor of, of machine learning. So it's like, Hey, how is this you know, strategic to the organization? How are we doing cost controls? How are we securing it to making sure that, you know, we don't expose ourselves to operational risk that exists in the organization. So that's a little bit of a long winded say of why our focus is so much on kind of like the security governance is really because operational software has a level of scrutiny and a big part of why, and I know you kind of make fun of this, I'll, I'll tell you, like when you double click onto like how many models don't get into production or like why it takes so long to get into production, it's not oh, no. putting a model on, on a flask app and saying that's hard, right? Or putting an API yeah. behind a model. It's actually getting through the security and governance requirements of an organization before you can certify a system as operational. That's the long tail of a lot of these uh, kind of like machine learning projects. Um, and that's kind of like, I, I know you like picking on that statistic, but like the reality here is it's just, you know, you're in a bank, getting through security might take six months. Hmm right? Uh, from the operational system and stuff like that. So that's kind of why, like, again, very much, you know, we, we take the ops part of MLOps very, very seriously. And it's really about the operational side of the, of the equation. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, before I, before I jump into my, my question here, I just want to say, uh, thanks again for your support. Whenever Diego is posting on a Slack thread, I'm always checking it out. I advise everyone listening to, if you're on the Slack, always, always check out those threads that Diego's commenting on. And also it's funny to look back now, but your meetup about build versus buy was my first meetup in the community. It's crazy to think of. that's what I realized. We were talking before this episode started about how we met and I was like, I met you, but you never met me because it was a meetup. <laughs> got it, got it. <laughs> um, so it makes sense what you're saying about really focusing in on this operational component of machine learning and how as that becomes more of a reality, some new risks are being presented, some new challenges for organizations are becoming a reality in a way that they haven't had to grapple with before. And, you know, I think one of the challenges, you know, as a machine learning engineer myself, is you start off coming from this world of, of, of ML and training algorithms, and you be, you're first exposed to software engineering and all the best practices there. And then you get exposed to this world of IT and infrastructure management and all these sort of um, components there, networking that, that seem a little bit foreign to you. And so now there's this newer component of security operations and security becoming more and more um, just not just the role of IT, but really the role of the entire organization. It's the responsibility of an entire organization um, to, to, to help ensure, um, you know, that, that things are secure. You know, what would you tell an MLE who is kind of learning about these components or sort of about, I guess, what we're trying to call ML SecOps? Um, you know, how would you tell them to go about getting started in this realm and understand their responsibility? Yeah, so, so one of the things that we do, so a lot of this is kind of like, organizational, like in a large, you know, like, like organization, if you're in a large enterprise, like you probably have uh, a DevSecOps team 
that you know is existing and established i would bet the house that that already exists there when you're starting to think about what you're going to be putting into production right and you kind of start that planning process and this is something like i talk about in the build versus buy like you have to have the end game in mind like you can't fit like well you can try but like figuring it out step by step is kind of a recipe for like this thing taking forever right like there's always a new door you know to kind of open up and so to learn around this, one of the things that we suggest teams is bring in your DevSecOps team as early as possible into the conversation and explain to them kind of like what it is that you're trying to do, where the system is going to be, because what you want is like, it's, it, it's kind of unfair on the ML engineer to be expected to literally know everything. Like, I mean, like, and that's kind of like, you know, we, we, we go out in the search and, and this is not a because of a lack of smarts or a lack of IQ or a lack of ability to learn. It's just like, there's a lot, right? Like suddenly you have to know everything about all the libraries. You need to know about data science, you need about training, you need about productionizing, you need about, and then on top of that, you need to know about like every single software process inside the organization. I mean, like it's really hard, right? And like, there's only 24 hours in a day. And so, you know, one of the things that we suggest is these are kind of perfect partnerships to make up early and bring in the IT and ops people into the conversation of how you move things into production as early as possible, because it has a dual purpose. One, the DevSecOps teams are not super aware of kind of like the intricacies of machine learning, right? Like they understand software, they understand IT, they understand MPO, you know, but they don't understand in a lot of cases, sometimes they do, about, you know, you know, kind of deterministic code versus probabilistic code. So like the code doesn't change, but things change because the data changed. And so, you know, there's this dual education process that happens in an organization as you drive through getting more of these, uh, you know, workloads. And it's, you have to think about it as an opportunity to educate both sides. You know, you want to get your DevSecOps team and your security teams like more up to speed on the, you know, kind of what it is the world of machine learning and how it's, you know, same but different in some cases from a software development perspective. Um, and you also want to learn about like where the gotchas are going to be, right? You know, because like, you know, in a lot of cases, and I'll give you like kind of a clear example of this, and this is kind of like a really basic one, but like, so let's just say you got this, you know, kind of container that you built out with a model and you plan on like deploying it as a flask app. Okay, what happens now when, you know, container baseline images need to be updated? Containers need to be scanned for uh, vulnerabilities on a you know, weekly basis. What happens when the system needs to be taken down? You know, so a lot of these banks kill all their systems on a weekly basis, repave. So imagine taking down the entire system with zero downtime uh, on a weekly basis to repave all the images from a security perspective, all the patches need to be coming. And so you're now dealing with a world where you're like, hey, I got the system up and running and I have my APIs running great. And now I need to repave the whole thing from a vulnerabilities perspective, just in case on a weekly basis. Like that's not something that you've probably gotten used to or even know how to deal with, right? Like, I mean, this is taking down entire Kubernetes clusters and like flipping them, right? Or like re, you know, and so these are just things that like, you know, people figure out and I'll go pick on Demetrius again on the, on the, on the like how long it takes to do these things. These are the things that take so long. Right, because suddenly you get to the end of the line and you're like, okay, we're ready for production. That only took like two months. Okay, great. Now take down the entire system and rehydrate it. Oh, need to go build that automation. It's gonna take me another six months. You know, so that's the kind of like thing bringing in the team early to understand. And different organizations, look, if you're in a startup and you know you don't have these kind of like super high like requirements, that's but you know any company that's increasing their maturity is gonna have a CISO. And that CISO is going to be looking at that operational system and determining risk, saying, okay, hey, this is what it's exposed to. This is where, you know, where we could potentially have attack vectors. And these are our policies to avoid that. And you're not going to get away just because you have the cool new machine learning from not being part of that conversation. Because at the end of the day, the risk component here is so big uh, that people are not. So you have to kind of either adapt to the process or work with that team to come up with a new process if that process is not adaptable to the world of machine learning. So to your original question about learning, I mean, bringing people in the conversation early and in the planning, like we always recommend, you know, 
second conversation that you're having around building out an operational system, bring in your DevSecOps team. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. I think that level of collaboration is key to any kind of organization that's seriously doing ML. I think, you know, honestly, I'll, I'll just say this as a, as, a, as, a, as a professional, and one of the big realizations you have to make is realizing that you can't do everything that has to happen. And the solution, it, stuff has to happen, sure, and you recognize it, but you got to bring people in. You have to figure out how to create leverage for your team and your project. And, and so I totally see how that, how that makes sense from a security standpoint in particular. I want to seize on one thing that you said there, which is about maturity and the maturity of these security processes. You know, I think one of the things that um, Demetrios and David spent a lot of time breaking down is so the sort of Google Cloud maturity model for MLOps systems, right? There's a seven step sort of rubric that they have and, you know, you can score yourself on that maturity if you're doing continuous retraining or if you're able to deploy automatically, all those different things. Do you think that we have such a clear sort of vision for what the maturity of uh, an ML system security is? And, and if so, um, what does that look like? So I think the baseline is there, right? And so, you know, like when you go look at, you know, and, uh, and we'll be publishing a, a new survey soon, like, you know, pretty much everybody right now is deploying some level of machine learning with Kubernetes. And Kubernetes itself has a security maturity thing that's going on right now, right? I mean, like it's, you know, like, I mean, it's not like we've been using Kubernetes for the last decade, right? And that's at the kind of container level, at the networking level, at the kind of like, and so there's, a, I, I, to answer your question specifically, I do think there's a maturity kind of like rubric applied to ML security. And a lot of it is around systems that you're using under the, the hood, right? So there's obviously things that are very specific to machine learning. Uh, and we'll probably talk around those things. They're mostly around, specifically around like, kind of like how can you affect the model or how can you affect the data, right? Like those are the ones that are very specific to, to machine learning, but like everything under the hood in terms of compute and networking and access controls and containers, all of those are, they, they mimic pretty well like, you know, kind of like the security models of any of the other kind of like components that exist in that, you know, kind of like IT world. Um, and so as long as you can kind of recognize those, that kind of split, um, I think there's a lot that can be inherited from, uh, you know, you know, the model. So, you know, kind of, um, and this is not, not nothing new, right? I mean, like these like security models are, are built out and pretty mature in a lot of organizations. A lot of it's around processes, right? Like, hey, you know, kind of talked about it. Like, hey, you, you know, we use these container registries. We use these uh, dependencies. You know, I, I used to joke around that like, I've seen super secure companies, right? Like they, they have like big, big focus on secure security, yet their data science, containers were allowed to bring in like anything they wanted from PyPy. And I'm like, well, that's an attack vector, right? Like, I mean, like, so right classic, thing, right? right? So it's, classic. Like, it's like, yeah, everything's locked down, but you can bring in anything from PyPy. And like, you know, how are you, how are you representing that? Like, how are you actually making sure that you're not causing issues? And so like, these are kind of like the, the details, like, you know, independency management's not a new thing and kind of like mirroring dependency package managers is not a new thing either. Right. And so it's, that's the maturity that like, you know, we look at where ML is running on top of and kind of the components that we use and we can inherit a lot of the security model from those while understanding that there's certain things around data and the models that are, you know, are different and you adapt those, which is kind of like the ethos of MLOps, right? To a certain degree, like, hey, we have general parameters of software development and software engineering and DevOps and, you know, we're adapting it to this new world of, you know, ML. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sorry, Demetrius, but I gotta go. I gotta ask another one. And something that you mentioned there, like this this concept of dependence dependency management not being a new thing. You know, PyPy being an attack vector, it makes total sense. And I think this speaks a little bit to the to the development workflow itself. And this is something that we talk about ad nauseum in in in, in the community is like the different flavors of machine learning professionals, their respective roles, and how their workflows impact and how they work impacting the ultimate delivery of ML solutions, right? So we talk about should data scientists know Docker, should data scientists know Kubernetes. In your experience, how are organizations that are doing security right 
dealing with the fact that their data scientists may want a lot of flexibility, um, their machine learning engineers may be thinking about how do I put something quickly into production, and then their IT professionals saying, I need something that's secure and well-specified. Like, How do organizations deal with that sort of professional complexity effectively? Yeah. Well, my answer is going to be super biased because we literally built a software platform for this. So okay, I'll, fair. I'll start with that, right? Uh, but, you know, um, so the way that I, I like to think about it is like, you know, it's IT and the kind of like ops team or under the CIO whose job is to provide an operational system that essentially has a service so that data scientists can move into production and provide them that flexibility. So if you split that world of ML dev, and ML prod, right? And you think, hey, prod is a system that's supposed to be built with the proper guardrails while giving that flexibility, right? That's kind of like, you know, what we see in kind of more mature organizations where you can actually grab models, you can build them, you can have the dependencies, but you can actually pull those dependencies from the right mirror. You can go check it, you know, security is taken care of for you, authentication is taken care of for you. The operational system and the scans are already set up. And so, you know, in the ideal world, you're just sitting in your kind of like data science platform, your auto ML platform, whatever it is that you're working with, you can push a model, right? Via CI CD or Git push or whatever it is like the methodology from automation there. And that triggers kind of like the process of going through kind of like the proper security scans, the proper, um, you know, uh, you know, kind of ability of, uh, of kind of packaging the whole thing in a way that's saying, look, you have all this flexibility. It's like maybe one way of thinking about it is like it's like a bowling alley with the guardrails up, right? So you can throw it as hard as you want and you're not going to be allowed to kind of like gutter it, but you can still kind of like, you know, have the flexibility as like, you know, throwing it in. So that's kind of like maybe a, a little dumb analogy, but like that's kind of the way I think about it. Like let's set up the gutters so that, you know, data science can actually be flexible. One thing to kind of, if you go historically and look at, you know, maybe before traditional machine learning, like, the quant in financial services that would actually deploy kind of like, you know, regression systems into production. How did that process work? It was usually written in R or MATLAB. It was given to a software engineer and they would rewrite it in C for performance reasons in a lot of cases. But again, there was a rewrite of the entire software and it was built into kind of like the software process that would have security and authenticate, you know, kind of all that. That rewrite can't happen anymore because we need the speed of, you know, kind of retraining and deploying. We want to give flexibility to the data scientists. So we kind of broke up that, you know, kind of like slow nature of like going from somebody in charge of hardening everything to now, hey, can we give you a pre-hardened environment so that you can actually flexibly go in and deploy? So that's, I think that's the, just the general trend out um, in being able to provide that. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think what I'm hearing is that you, you have to bake these kinds of best practices, these, these, these sort of accepted ways of doing things, the secure way of doing things or the efficient way of doing things into the platforms that you're using. And that's really the responsibility of, you know, in an organization that might have a CIO, a CIO or a CTO or a chief data science officer, whoever it is that's responsible, they need to bake it in at an underlying level. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. I think like it's automation, 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 automation. And automation yeah. includes security, authentication, governance. Like that's like, these are the things that like, if you're building it up one off per environment or one system, like, first of all, it's completely uncontrollable. Your technical debt gets like out of control. Um, you're spending, you know, you asked about like, what does an ML engineer need to learn about dev security? Well, like what you don't want to learn is how to do this every single time there's a new use case. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, I mean, like yeah. that's just yeah. not a good use of your time. Yeah. So Vishnu took all of the questions that I had, but luckily I thought of some new ones on the fly. And when you were talking, there, there were some awesome things that you're saying around how you think, like your vision for the future is everything is going to have machine learning involved in it. There's not going to be this separation that we see right now, right? From DevOps to MLOps, and it's just going to all be some kind of implied machine learning because it will touch everything uh, after a few years maybe that's in five years maybe that's in 10 years maybe that's next month who knows but i'm wondering along those lines there are some pretty significant hurdles that we need to clear before that happens and you were talking about this to make it so that we feel like 
when we operationalize something, it is bulletproof. Can you talk about some of those hurdles that need to be cleared? Yeah. So I would argue that there's no such thing as bulletproof in software. Like that doesn't exist. It never has and never will. Right. But what you can do is you can reduce risk by a lot. Right. Like there's no such thing as an impenetrable software system. Period. Right. But you can you can you can cover your bases. Right. And you can and you can do that. And so a lot of it is around doing exactly that. And so if, if, if you look at it from a, from a risk framework is actually really interesting. Right. Because so essentially there's kind of three risks that an organization can take. Right. There's kind of operational risk. Something goes wrong. I lose a lot of money. Right. There's brand risk. Something goes wrong. I look really, really bad. And I can reduce those risks by tightening everything. And I can go to the extreme. There's a pendulum, right? Where I like lock down everything. Nothing gets into production. It takes 24 months to get anything into production because I've like completely locked it down. Now I've exposed myself to what's called strategic risk, the risk of not doing it. And this is particularly important in ML, right? Where it's like, hey, what, what am I losing by not, you know, you know, putting this model into production? What am I losing by not doing that? And so there's a pendulum between these, this kind of strategic risk and the operational and brand risk that needs to be kind of like, you know, navigated. And you can do a lot of that with just making sure that the systems that you're building and the kind of operational systems can kind of like take into account a lot of the things that avoid the operational and that brand risk, which is, you know, I got hacked, I got, you know, a lot, which again, a lot of this is, is somewhat known, but you know, I'll, I'll double click on the fact that like, there's no such thing as an impenetrable system. Like that's it's software, right? Unless mm. you're like, even, you know, I mean, I guess if you're in a completely air gapped environment, but you know, we've all seen a Tom Cruise movie. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So maybe we should go and, and zoom in a little bit on what some, some specific machine learning security risks are and and also i think the i vishnu just wrote me on slack right now <laughs> saying that those three types of risks that if you haven't written a blog post on it we may have to write a blog post on it because that is some wisdom right there the idea of all of these different risks that you're facing and how you can't be extreme with one or the other because the more you go to this side, then the more risk you're going to have on the strategy side or vice versa, that kind of thing. So that's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's uh, a trade-off. Blog on it? It's a trade-off, not, a, not necessarily a choice, right? You don't just pick yeah. and say, oh, yeah, I'm going to take on, I'm going to prevent brand risk. It's like, okay, if you're going to do that, you're, you're taking on some strategic risk. You got to make a trade-off there. So I think yeah. that's, that's definitely a blog post. And it's definitely, and it's, you know, and then it has to be, this is why, like, I always talk about, like, thinking about the business value of what you're getting in production and what you're doing here, right? Because if your risk is is super high and the ROI potential is low, like, that's a trade-off, again, that you need to make. Now, if your ROI is potentially super high on what you're doing, hey, we're going to go reduce fraud by, I don't know, 90%, but, like, we're going to take, you know, like, and that's a giant number, you know, like, we, you, you, it's, you have to make these decisions on like, you know, risk reward. Um, there's entire offices inside financial services that are doing this right on a daily basis. Uh, and so that's kind of like, how do you imply those systems is, is also, uh, important. Exactly. So let's jump into some of these specific machine learning security risks and what, as a machine learning engineer, we can talk to others about, especially like you were mentioning, like the DevSecOps teams that have to come in and they potentially are going to kill your whole project because it doesn't live up to standards or their standards. And on the other side, there may be things that you know about as a machine learning engineer that you want to tell them about. So it's not like they're flying blind. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's kind of like five big categories, or at least today, you know, and I'm probably like selling it short of some, some of the categories that we see. You can see essentially risks around data confidentiality. Like, did I somehow leak data in any of the process in terms of PII or, you know, what am I using, especially if it's sensitive information? And so, and, and that's no different, in my opinion, from 
traditional analytic systems, right? Like you have that same risk and there's, you know, ways of locking it down and understanding it. And, you know, consider, you know, a lot of companies have this concept of like platinum data and gold data and have just different standards around like who can access it and why they can access it. And, you know, like if you're a credit card processor and you have super high, you know, you probably shouldn't be, you know, you should be careful with like exposing people's credit card behaviors and stuff like that. And so these are kind of around that data confidentiality. Um, you have kind of system manipulation, uh, kind of like, uh, you know, uh, ML security risk. And this is where you're exposing potentially a recommender to the outside world. You're potentially exposing something like an endpoint, right? Where somebody outside your organization can interact with it. And especially in an online learning scenario, like could somebody manipulate it to take advantage of it? So like, could you somehow trick a recommender into giving you a bunch of discounts? Could you somehow trick a, you know, kind of like, you know, betting site potentially that's using kind of like uh, your model to give you like some different, uh, I don't know, like, you know, like there's like when you're exposing a, uh, a, a NML system that takes in inputs and potentially can actually, um, you know, uh, you know, respond to it and you can take advantage of it. Like that's the, the kind of like system manipulation. There's um, adversarial examples uh, why, like, you know, which is similar to the one in the system where you start giving it bad examples uh, in the expectation to kind of like veer off the model in one way or the other. Right. And uh, by, you know, by looking at it and, uh, you know, there's there's a world where you can actually like it's, it's pretty hard, but there's a world where you can kind of reverse engineer a model by essentially seeing like you know like feeding it a whole bunch of data and understanding like where you know how that comes back and say okay now i actually understand how this model is working uh and potentially manipulate it right and so these are kind of like the attacks that you can that probably a devsecops person is not thinking about but an ml engineer would start being like okay how do i you know uh do that in the transfer learning world, like if you use the baseline model, you know, like everybody uses kind of these, and I don't actually know of any attacks in this space. I'm just kind of thinking out loud, like everybody's kind of using the same base NLP models, you know, kind of like, could you, you know, from a transfer learning perspective, like go reverse engineer one of these like NLP models that, you know, to make it say something bad. I mean, it wasn't really an attack, but you saw like what happened with like Tay and Microsoft Tay and a bunch of these like, you know, language bots where, you know, people got them to be really racist. There you go to your brand risk, right? Like if we go back to that brand risk, like, you know, like people were manipulating yeah. these models to, uh, and they had to shut it off because, you know, the last thing Microsoft wanted was a racist bot. Uh, and, you know, and people figured out how to like get it to do that. Uh, so these are kind of some of that, those, those um, you can poison the data, you can, so these are kind of like, like, like some of the categories of, uh, but they're really like, you know, they come down to, can I leak data in some bad way that I shouldn't be, or can I manipulate the system to do something that it shouldn't be doing? And this is where kind of like proper monitoring and proper kind of like understanding of what can potentially go wrong with a model is super important because to your point, Vishnu, like the DevSecOps people probably unlikely to understand this, mm -hmm. um, you know, this, this attack, they're like, they're like, Hey, the containers are secure, the network's secure, the authentication secure, like I got everything. It's like, okay, well, here's another level of security that's important. Um, and then, you know, again, like going back to that exposure risk, like an internal system, machine to machine inside, your exposure area is like, okay, somebody, a bad actor inside your organization or something that went wrong by mistake. If you have an externally exposed, you know, system, now you're, you know, random person from the internet. So like, you have to kind of measure where that risk comes in. Yeah, I think it's really helpful to hear how, again, how to think about risk, what the different forms of risk are. And one of the things that comes to, you know, comes to mind for me, just from like a very basic standpoint is, you know, I think, you know, to some degree, our impression of security in, in, in the entire like culture and internet culture and everything is still kind of stuck in the Nigerian Prince era, right? It's like some bad guy out there to get you, and I think for a lot of employees, you know, especially because it's not like security is taught, you know, as one of the first five things you learn in school or even when you walk into a work environment a lot of times, right? It's just one of those like corporate training things you got to do. Uh, I think it's hard to really embrace the security mindset beyond just kind of saying, oh, you know, there are a couple bad guys. And I think 
the downside of that is, especially like I work at a smaller company, um, it's easy as a smaller company or at, you know, maybe a non-consumer facing company to kind of be like, well, we're not really a target anyway. And, you know, not necessarily think that this is something that you have to embrace earlier on. Uh, I know that you've mentioned a lot that financial services is an industry that you've mentioned as an example. And I could see there, you know, for example, that mindset being a little bit more sort of aggressive because money's at stake. What would you say to, you know, professionals or, or employees or even employers who may kind of have a little bit of a lax attitude towards security right now? Um, how would you kind of encourage them to change their mindset? You know, I'd actually, I don't know if I would change their mindset. I would actually just make the, like the offset decision, right? Make that risk reward decision, right? It takes time and money and to, to, to figure out security, right? Like, I mean, like, like it's, it's, it's a fact, right? And yeah. if you're looking at it and you're making this like a conscious, like the, the, the problem is when you don't make a conscious decision, right? That's when you get burnt really bad. For right? sure, for like, sure, right. like, like the, the lack of awareness is a problem, right? But like, you can actually, you know, I wouldn't go and say, look, you know, you, you know, everybody needs to be thinking about security on day one. Like, I mean, that would be ideal, but you know, I think there's a risk reward ratio here in terms of like, look, you look at your system, you look at where it's exposed. If I have an internal recommender that's only exposed between my machines, it's very kind of like, and what's the, what's the potential outcome that, that could be problematic, right? I mean, like, I'll give you a good example of this. Like, is there a really big high risk? And, and I know the Spotify folks are always on it. And so I'm, I'm talking out of turn here because I don't like, but like, I can't really imagine a world where like, you know, get, you know, poisoning the Spotify recommender, like, you know, somehow like becomes a problem. Maybe I can think down to it's like, okay, suddenly like there's a random artist that gets like a bazillion hits and now they have to pay out royalties to that. Like, I mean, I know. Hopefully I'm it's me. The random huh? artist is myself, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, there you go. But like, you know, like, that one out. there's systems where it's like, you know, the, 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 the risk is just not like the, the risk reward to the cost of getting things done is just not there. So to you, Vishnu, in your, in your company, what I would be looking at is saying like, okay, well, where do we, what do we do with machine learning? And what, you know, as long as you have awareness, what could potentially go wrong? And where could this be like, you know, how would this be problematic for the organization? And are we an increased target of it, right? Because eventually everybody becomes, you know, the more valuable a system, the more it becomes a target and the larger the surface area of that. And so it's really you've got figuring out, look, you know, for us, you know, I mean, then just like you could say, hey, look, we use ML internally only. There's nothing exposed to the outside world. And the worst case scenario, you know, model gone wild, like we capture that and it's not really a big problem. And so you don't have to, like, why would you go spend a ton of time on security today? That might change over time. I think it's a bigger problem when you're just not aware of like what the potential like, you know, risk and problem becomes. And like, if you go into it completely blind and then suddenly get bit, bit that's where, you know, so I think you can make a, you can make a conscious decision. Well, that's, so my question is, as the machine learning engineer in this situation, how do you properly think through the situation that you're getting yourself into. Like, how do you know all of these data points? Is it just by educating yourself on ways that you can mess up or talking to different DevSec ops people? Like, how can I, as a machine learning engineer, be more conscientious when I'm trying to build these systems? So I, I think you, you always start with the end result, right? Like, what, what are we actually doing? What's the business case for this machine learning workflow? Right. What am I affecting? Right. And when you look at that use case, again, just forget about technology for a second. Like you're looking at the use case and be like, OK, well, now that I'm looking at the use case, what are the risks of getting this wrong? Right. And then when am I looking at the risk of getting it wrong, how could I get it wrong? And you start kind of going down there and what you'll find in that kind of like workflow thinking like kind of like from the end result backwards is you'll start exposing a lot of places where like, where could this go wrong? And then, you know, I mean, if you want to get really precise about it, you can be like, okay, let me try to make a, you know, machine learning engineers are pretty good about this. Let me make a probabilistic assessment of what I think is potentially like, you know, where these things could go wrong and work backwards and then make a decision on, you know, kind of a cost benefit analysis. 
you know, I'm, I'm probably being more prescriptive here than necessary, but like, this is something that you should be able to like understand that like, if I, you know, if what I'm building is a, is a fraud system, right? Risk of getting wrong is big. And like, okay, and who's exposed to the fraud system and how do they get involved and who could actually access it? And, you know, these are kind of the things where like, look at the end result of the workflow and understand the value of that workflow, which you should know at that point, right? Because if you're going into an ML workflow without understanding what the end value is gonna be, it's not a good sign. And now you could understand, okay, if I start working backwards, where are the risks? And I can, that's how I would, you know, educate myself in terms of like what could potentially go there. And you'll see that as you work through that, you'll find that there's a lot of opinions, A, and there's a lot of people who are going to be helping like involved in like kind of like figuring that out. Yeah, this sounds a lot like those, uh, the five whys that Toyota does you know, where it's like a root cause analysis. It's a similar yep. sort of thing that you can apply in the sort of, you know, ML security realm. And it kind of gets me going and thinking, this is a really cool like workshop or blog post or something for us to do. It's kind of just uh, the the same way that, that there's like a, there's an article that we read in the reading group, um, Continuous Delivery for Machine Learning, where, you know, they talked through a Martin Fowler post where they talked through, you know, how you do CD for an ML system. It'd be really cool to do the same thing for a sample sort of ML system and saying like, well, what does security look like? What are those questions going through them, answering them? I think I think we may have our next point of collaboration, Diego, here. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So look, look, you know, the pretty much every single large company that builds software has threat modeling associated with building a new component yeah. of the software, right? And I think that like, there's a natural next step here where there's threat modeling for ML systems. And it's a task that gets built and understood and nobody's going to enjoy doing it. But like, you know, it's kind of like a necessary evil where, you know, um, you know, again, my, you know, I, my experience working at, at Microsoft, like there was not a single piece of software we could ship that didn't have an associated threat model with it. Right. What's the surface area? What's the potential attack surface area? How do we get through that? And this was a collaboration between, you know, the technical PMs like myself or the and the InfoSec and DevSecOps teams where they would help you build out and you know they would ask you a bunch of questions and help you like build out a threat model around it and like i think that threat modeling scenario for machine learning is clear like if we're if that's going to be the future of software like you know we're going to have to be building out these threat models yeah I, I love that threat modeling for ml ops that's it that's the post of our that's our that's the title of our blog post um along these a lot lines of work. <laughs> yeah i know There's a right? lot of blog posts that we're going to be <laughs> writing after this one so much content. Yeah. Um, so slightly different direction, I kind of want to uh, take this in. And and that's really around, you know, kind of going back to the idea of bake, baking in best practices. And, you know, something that's, you know, I think inspiring a lot of people in the MLOps world is kind of how DevOps evolved with, you know, infrastructure as code. So something like, you know, AWS CloudFormation and, and CDK um, and, you know, uh, serverless and, and a lot of other sort of um, DevOps frameworks. What they did was take a manual process that operations professionals and de development professionals were collaborating on and turn it into a, a codable process, turn it into something that could take advantage of the beautiful properties of code. Anybody can write it, it can be version controlled, um, and it can be, you know, scaled. So my question to you is, we've seen this happen with, um, you know, with infrastructure, um, we've seen it happen with other components of the entire software creation process. Do you see a future where we have almost like security as code? Is that already a reality? Um, is that possible? Yeah, I think, I mean, I mean, I mean, I think like in the component of infrastructure as code, security is baked into that, like, or in a lot of the, like, I mean, if you go look at anybody, you know, if you think about how you're developing a, you know, something in AWS or in like GCP, like, like you start with setting up all of it permissioning and IAM roles, right? Yeah, I mean, that's step one. It's annoying, right? but it's true. <laughs> the, the world of infrastructure as code is like, you know, security and auth is like a big, big part of that. And so there's a question now of like, okay, can we build that same concept into our machine learning workflows? And I would say, yes. I mean, that's what we've, again, a little bit biased because that's what we've done with our platform, which is, you know, kind of how you actually go deploy and run, like, you know, it's, security is built into it, right? So for every model that you deploy in Algorithmia, 
like authentication is already set up, like uh, audit controls of all the models, who's calling it what, when, with what data is already set up for you. Uh, you know, which uh, package managers you can um, you can access and use and how those dependencies get managed are already set up. The use of the source code management system under you, which will now have all the code scans and the dependabots and all these kind of like is already set up. And so that's kind of the concept of like automating the, you know, kind of like security layer and governance layer of your production pipeline. Um, so that, you know, from a ML engineer, you know, the ideal world is I got a candidate model, I pushed it into production, right? And like everything else was just done, right? Like that fully automated. So, yeah, I think, so it sounds like what you're saying is that there's certain areas of the threat model, basically, that you kind of have managed away or, or you know, abstracted an algorithm. And that's, I think I really appreciate some of the examples that you mentioned around the package managers, the dependencies. It's pretty powerful to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to jump in and talk to you at the risk of talking about everything and us not having more information to talk about the next time we chat but i think that's impossible because i originally told diego hey let's try and do this for like i don't know an hour and a half two hours and <laughs> he was like whoa 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 i i can't have a podcast be longer than a workout session and apparently he's also busy running a company, so we can't, can't take up too much of his time. But I do want to talk to you real fast about this idea that you told me the last time we spoke, the MLRE. Can you share some or shed some light on that? Yeah. So, okay. So like, like let's think about, you know, what happens when an operational, who, who gets called when an operational system goes bad? in an organization today. Like there's an entire world of people which are SREs, right? I mean, like they're, you know, pagers, response time, like up, like this whole concept of like, I am, you know, the first line of defense. Something goes wrong, I'm getting woken up, I need to jump on it and I need to fix it, right? And especially with cloud and SaaS, like this is like, you know, core, core, right? To how most, multiple companies operate. I'm sure, you know, you guys have them as well. You have these SREs folks that are like, you know, inside your organization and, 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 and responsible for that. So what happens now when you need somebody who needs to be able to react to like, not just the application. So the traditional way that this would work would be like, Hey, something went wrong with my operational system. I, you know, wake up, I look at it. Hey, was it a networking problem? Blah, blah, blah. Like kind of like, operational problem and no it was something with the model i'm gonna go wake up the data scientist and say hey something's wrong with this model we should go you know you should go do that right and like then the model the data scientist will go in and kind of investigate okay what happened with the model was it a data problem was it a feature problem was it like you know what, what was why did this go wrong i think as more and more real-time systems get lifted up right we're going to have quick response teams that are more trained in machine learning, but are you know really responsible for the operational application, right? Like if your entire business is based on a recommender system to like sell more stuff, like you're probably gonna move some people to be kind of like unless ML reliability engineer, which is you own not just the ML model, but also the application that that's running through. And you are that first line of defense, right? And maybe all you do here is say, hey, look, this new model, you know, especially when models are being like published automatically, right? Like, so if you think about like, kind of like online learning, like how, how do you like, hey, something went wrong, I need to roll it back. I need to go like, I, you know, I need to go do something with that system. And so I think we're gonna start seeing like SREs that are more ML uh, like, like skilled. And, you know, cause, and so I see kind of this world of the SRE that are gonna start learning more and more of the ML skills. What can go wrong? in the ML world and be more conscious of that. So I don't think it's like ML engineers becoming SREs. I think it's actually SREs becoming more ML conscious. Yeah, I think that's that's a that's a brilliant point. And you know, I can already see the points of sort of interface where that can occur, right? You know, if you're doing continuous training or something of that sort, your training set gets polluted by some, you know, sampling bug. Um, you know, you uh, have an unexpected, um, you know, drop in performance. Turns out that the test set that you sampled 
you know, may not have necessarily been the best possible sample. Um, and I think it's interesting actually to yeah. see, um, I like looking at papers from KDD, the conference, because you always get interesting sort of MLOps papers, um, you know, backwards compatibility, you know, changes between different updates um, and how that breaks certain systems. There's a lot of research going on and you could see how ML REs could start to be the interface yeah. between, you know, production and, and development environments. Yeah, um, and not to put you on the spot, Vishnu, but do you do you do you are you on pager duty? Like, do you have a pager like for for your workload, or is it somebody else who is? It's not me. It's somebody else. Yeah, exactly. Um, right, and that's yeah. and that's probably the, the the most common answer that you're going to hear from ML engineers and data scientists. And it's like, okay, great. So now, who's that person wearing the pager, and how far can they take? their debugging or action like how quickly they can they react or they depend on bringing you vishnu into the picture and so i think this 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 idea of a skill set for you know sres that are going to be more ml focused um is going to allow that quick you know that quick action reaction time uh to problems and that's kind of where i see that 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 i think i didn't mean to put you in the spot it's just like that's a very natural thing that we see like you know like data scientists they usually wear pages yeah, no, for sure. I, I, I totally, totally get that. No worries at all. Um, yeah, I, I don't wear that pager, and I don't, I don't wish to. I don't have, I don't want to have that, 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 that brick of <laughs> lead on me. <laughs> He's happy just passing the buck, and for sure. giving it off to somebody else. That's somebody else's. But as uh, others have said, you know, it's like that mentality definitely needs to come into the picture more as like you start to realize hey i'm responsible for the result and the output of whatever i am creating i'm not just responsible for my one little piece and so having this missing piece of the whole team i think is a really interesting part and i like how you're talking about it from going from an sre perspective and getting more involved with the machine learning side as opposed to trying to go the other way i think that's a really important point so this has been awesome diego once again you you do not fail to give me so many things to think about i cannot tell you how much i'm going to probably reflect back on this and then reiterate what you say here in many of the podcasts to come and many of the different meetups because there are so many gems in this i think we just barely scratched the surface of the blog post that we mentioned before so if anyone wants to really get down and dirty with all of this security stuff and not have it be <laughs> as uh, we went off on a few tangents there like if you want it more focused the blog post is in the description have a read of it and also it would mean a lot to us if you gave this video a thumbs up or if you're on podcast land subscribe so we can keep doing more of it again diego thank you so much for the support thank you algorithmia for sponsoring the community it is absolutely amazing to see the amount of like just weight that you put behind this and the wisdom that you bring not only to anytime you jump in a thread on slack but these conversations that we have so thanks again. Love chatting with you guys. Thanks so much for uh, for the invite and, uh, and the conversation. And I look forward to the next one. There we go. Lots See of blog ya. posts to come. <laughs> Lots of blog posts. That's what we get to promise you. We're always saying we're going to write blog posts, but we never really do. Hey. I mean, we have kind of. But Positivity, come on. There we go. I Vishnu, this one's on you. All right, fine. <laughs> I just throw it over the fence to Vishnu and let him take it. But oh, we'll see you all later. <laughs>